The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, outdated before its time. Tactics and strategy, multiple mode air radar systems, and metal beasts, a naval aircraft with curious wings. Almost every top-ranking air battle has at least a single American Phantom or Freedom Fighter. But this plane often stays in the shadow. The F-8E Crusader, a carrier-based supersonic fighter. You can find it in the tech trees of France and the USA. Its power plant is a single turbojet engine with an afterburner. Its wing and fuselage house self-sealing fuel tanks, while the nose cone hides an onboard radar system. The fixed armament includes four 20mm autocannons with a total ammo pool of 576 rounds. The American Crusader can also carry bombs of various calibers, rockets, air-to-air -air, and air-to-surface guided missiles. The French version can only carry a range of air-to-air -air missiles. A curious fact about the F-8 is that it has a wing with a variable sweep. This design feature improves takeoff and landing performance, which is essential on the deck of an aircraft carrier. Speaking of tactics, this machine finds itself somewhere between the Phantom and the Freedom Fighter. Not as fast and heavily armed as the former, and less maneuverable than the latter. Anyway, the best tactic on this aircraft is still the high-speed boom-and-zoom attacks. With four 20mm cannons and a nice ammo pool, you don't even have to be that accurate. Moreover, you can take four Sidewinder missiles of various modifications. Our recommendation is to go for either D modification, the infrared one, or the C modification, the radar-guided one. The former is great for close combat when you need a quick missile launch, while the latter requires a target lock using radar first, which means a longer launch delay. On the plus side, the radar-guided missile is an all-aspect one, so you can use it even head-on. If you don't know which one you'll need, you can take a mix of both. The French version of the fighter shows a significantly different performance in air battles. Between its infrared homing missiles, the best one is the R-550, while for the radar-guided ones you can use the R-530. Unfortunately, you can only take two missiles of each kind, and there is no countermeasures available unlike on the American version. Finally, a few words about mixed battles. Bombs and rockets are tricky to use due to a missing ballistic computer on this aircraft. But two bullpups can handle the task perfectly. Moreover, you can still take the air-to-air -air missiles, which means the Crusader is still a strong fighter after taking out a couple of ground targets. The air forces of the Imperial Japanese Navy paid a high price for their arrogance. The Zeros, their best fighters with an enormous combat range, were wrecking everything all the way through Asia and the Pacific, delivering devastating blows to Allied forces, like the Typhoon. Their pilots were small in number, but well-trained and skillful, leaving American, English and Dutch fighters no chances. Some data says that the win ratio was 1 to 50 in the first half of 1942, in favor of Japan. Then the Battle of Midway happened. Burning Japanese aircraft carriers became bonfires signaling the grand finale of their imminent advance. And the Zero's advantages turned into flaws. Long range? What's the point if the Americans were coming so close to them now? Japanese ace pilots were down one after the other. The newest Hellcats, Corsairs and Lightnings, attacked them from above, at higher speeds and in force. 
No matter how many turns you can spin on your Zero, you're getting hit one way or another. A single browning bullet to your non-self-sealing fuel tank and <laughs> boom! A single volley to the unprotected pilot cockpit and the now unmanned Zero falls into the ocean. In all fairness, they could have foreseen such an outcome. They could have reduced the range to something more sensible, added some armor to the cockpit, add a CO2 compressor and self-sealing walls for the fuel tanks, install a fire extinguisher. The Zero's design had enough space for all of this. But it was too late. The A6M3 modification produced in July of 1942 did have a smaller range, but only because of a more powerful, hungrier engine that had a little bit higher top speed. The survivability problem was not being solved at all. The pilots were dying, and the command in all their wisdom switched from a long, harsh training course with careful selection to the very opposite. The front line started to receive green recruits who couldn't use the Zero to its full potential. It took them as long as until early 1944 to make the A6M5 modification with an armored cockpit and an FPE. It was also the first one to finally have large caliber machine guns replace the useless 7.7mm ones. The Air Forces only received them by the end of the year. But by that time, 1945 was dangerously close, and that year brought along the desperate Battle of Iwo Jima and defeat in Okinawa, burning Japanese cities and finally the capitulation. But we're still puzzled. Why hadn't they introduced the 1944 improvements earlier? Japan had everything it needed for that. The engines, the armor, and the guns. Even the design of the aircraft still had room for improvement left by the end of the war. Why did the Imperial Japanese Navy Command allow their best fighter to become outdated before its time? Historians refer to the command being too narrow-minded, or to the engineers being overburdened, or to the pilots being too dogmatic, and sometimes to the limited production capabilities. As is often the case with history, there's no consensus on this question, and there might never be. Radar has been a familiar tool for pilots of top and sub-top planes for a while now, but progress has been moving forward bringing new functions to in-game radar systems, so today we're going to help you make out what's what. First, you can set up all the quick key bindings by going to Controls, Aircraft, Weaponry. If you already have too many binds to fit some more, you can always use the multifunctional menu, which can be brought up at pressing the Y button by default. Many top fighters' radar systems have multiple working modes. To learn the specifics for each machine, go to the X-ray mode and point your cursor at the radar. Now for a bit more detail. The first one is the standard mode. Your radar shows all the air targets in its view, and the friend or foe system shows which one's not friendly enough today. The main flaw here is the radar becoming unreliable when pointed at the ground or a water surface because those create interference. If you need a target lock in this situation, switch the radar to pulse Doppler mode. You can do that with the change radar slash IRST mode switch. Keep in mind, this mode turns off the friend or foe system, which might create an issue in battles, with no markers for other players. Some planes like the MiG-23 also have an IRST in addition to radar. There's an option switch between radar and IRST you can use. The optical locator is unique in its stealth target acquisition capability, which means your enemy won't know they're being locked onto. Eh, 
even if they have a radar warning system. By the way, it might sound counterintuitive, but an aircraft radar can help infrared-guided missiles too by increasing their target acquisition range significantly. Finally, there's a way to change the radar search mode. Here's how it works. Increasing the search range makes the scanning process slower, which means a lower update speed. And naturally, you can do the opposite. Decrease the range and get a higher update speed. This directly impacts the amount of time your system needs for a target lock. That's why radar on most modern fighters can be switched to close combat mode. The search field becomes so narrow, it's easy to miss an actively maneuvering target, but target lock happens much faster. Well, that's basically everything we wanted to share about radar systems. Now it's time to sneak into the comments to answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Thomas F. How to install dev versions of War Thunder? Hi Thomas, you can only access the dev server during open testing. If you want to join, go to the official War Thunder forum, find the dev server branch, and choose a topic with a relevant testing date. Download the dev client at the link, and you're ready to go. Faraz Aulia asked, Can we download our saved replay? <laughs> Hi there! You already have all your replays on your computer. You just need to find the folder they're stored in. You can do it in the game by going to Community, comma, Replays and pressing the Open Folder button in the bottom left corner. Here you go. All your saved replays are here. Another question comes from Big Ounce. What are the best three Japanese planes for ground pounding? Hey, Big Ounce, choosing only three is a pretty tricky idea since there's a lot of nuances. Let's take a look at all the noteworthy models instead. For early ranks, carrier-based bombers are pretty much fun to play, especially the D4Y3 core and the B7A2. Among piston fighters, the best ones for assault are the A7M2, the J2M3, and the N1K2. For early jets, we recommend the Kika and the R2Y2. As for top rank battles, the F4EJ and the F1 will perform the best. Skarken writes, does the in-game map follow the cardinal directions, north, south, east and west? Hello there! The game has many locations inspired by real-world places. Berlin, Port Novorossiysk, Advance to the Rhine, Stalingrad, Breslau, Honolulu, Port Moresby, Lake Ladoga, Malta, Sicily, Korea and many others. On these maps, the cardinal directions are true to their real counterparts. And the last comment for today was written by Slicer Axe Gaming. What are the clamp-like devices on the Merkava's cannon barrel for? Are they part of the gun assembly? Hi, Slicer Axe. These clamps hold a special heat shield. It decreases the barrel's deformation caused by uneven heating and improves the weapon's accuracy. Cracky, how time flies. Well, that's it for today, folks. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Uh, you know the drill, don't you? Don't forget to fill your radar fluid and leave a like. I demand it. Share your thoughts and comments and, uh, yeah, I'll see you next week.